Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1 in our continuing study of the Pauline Epistles. The city of Ephesus is located on the Aegean. Um, the city is located between two hills. Um, here's the main street uh, going down toward what used to be the harbor. The, the harbor silted up many, many hundreds of years ago, actually over 2,000 years um, and so you can see the sea way, way in the distance. But in the first century, where, when Paul was here, the, 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 the river or the ocean came right up to those trees in the distance. It was a wealthy city as uh, seen when you look at the, the, um, the sidewalks. Some of the sidewalks have these beautiful mosaics that have stood the test of time. They, they are still delightful to look at. Um, even 2,000 years later. The city boasted a huge theater, and of course that comes into the story in uh, Acts chapter 19 when, when pagans gather in, uh, in protest of all these Christians that are coming into being and destroying their idols. And, and the, the uh, idol guild-making union got all upset about that. But that was now in the past, and Paul writes to this city uh, by now, this is one of his prison epistles, so he's writing from prison. Uh, of course, the recipients of the epistle are the church at Ephesus, or so it would seem, and, and I think that's the case. It's addressed to the saints who were at Ephesus, right in chapter 1 and verse 1. And at the end of the epistle, Tychicus is going to be mentioned. He's going to be sent with news, probably carrying this epistle. And he's also mentioned in Colossians and Philemon as ha having carried those epistles as well. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 uh, makes mention of him um, with someone named Anispus. We'll talk about him in, in just a bit. Now, it's possible that this letter also became, these two views are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I do think it was addressed to the church of, at Ephesus, but it also becomes a circular letter. Um, for example, we have found uh, some copies where the term at Ephesus found in chapter 1, verse 1, are not in some of those manuscripts, where when they were copying it, perhaps they just left out the, uh, that phrase at Ephesus so that it could now be applied to other churches to whom copies were now sent. There are almost no personal notes included. Uh, a little note about Tychicus at the end, but for the most part, uh, this could have been a generic epistle um, think about how often Paul talks about his own experiences, about his background, about his travels. None of that is in this epistle. The purpose of the epistle, first of all, to confirm the position that we have in Christ. It's going to talk about uh, who we are uh, as part of the body of Christ. So, to confirm the position that we have in Christ. Secondly, to explain the relationship of Jewish and Gentile believers uh, and how they fit in one with another. Remember that before the coming of Jesus, uh, Jews were Jews and they had nothing to do when they could help it with those nasty old Gentiles. And so, uh, here they are going to be brought into one body. How does that work? Does that mean Jews have to become um, Gentile in their outlook? Does that mean Gentiles have to be circumcised and become Jewish? Um, or maybe start keeping some of the Jewish rituals? And Paul's going to uh, look at that and explain that in the middle of this epistle, especially in the latter part of chapter 2. Uh, finally, he will be describing what should be the corresponding conduct which believers ought to exhibit as a result of the new position that we have. And so that's actually going to, the first, those first two points are going to be covered in the first three chapters. And then chapters four, five, and six are going to be describing that conduct. How do we live uh, in light of our new position? If we could have had a envelope, and they did have envelopes back then. I don't know that this ever fit into one. Uh, but notice, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and he's writing from a Roman prison. Um, the stamps, notice I put Tychicus and Onesimus. Onesimus isn't mentioned uh, here in this epistle, but Tychicus is, and we find out from Colossians and Philemon that Onesimus is being accompanied by Tychicus, and apparently they are carrying several letters. <laughs> um, this one notice to the saints and faithful ones in care of Ephesus, uh, Asia Minor. That's what we call it uh, as, a, as an area. Uh, it's the modern-day country of Turkey today. 
Here's our outline, very simple. Chapters 1 through 3 are the wealth of the Christian. Chapters 4 through 6 are the walk of the Christian. Now, unless you think that just sounds like a nice sermon title because you have two W's, uh, let me notice that you have references to wealth beginning in chapter 1, verse 7, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance. Of course, these are spiritual, uh, sp- this is speaking of spiritual wealth. Verse four, Chapter 1, verse 14, a pledge of our inheritance. Uh, verse 18, the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Chapter 2, verse 7, the surpassing riches of his grace. Chapter 3, verse 8, the unfathomable riches of his grace. And chapter 3 and verse 16, the riches of his glory. All those references to wealth, uh, of course, the spiritual wealth. When we get to chapter 4, there's a change. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul calls us to walk, and that's the term that we're looking at. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Uh, Verse 17, walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love. Now, in each of these, uh, walking is used as a metaphor for living the Christian life. In fact, even today, we talk about the Christian walk, and this is where we get it from. Chapter 5, verse 8, walk as children of light. Chapter 5 and verse 15, be careful how you walk. When we get to chapter 6, it's going to change from walking to standing. I'm not going to, I guess I probably could put a third grouping here, but I'm going to leave it uh, connected to the walk. Stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Uh, Chapter 6 and verse 13, stand firm. Verse 14, stand firm. And so we're going to have that mentioned a a few times. I I didn't list quite all of them. Uh, I just ran out of room, but, but we could have continued with that. And so we begin uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God, very simple, uh, and yet he's describing himself as an apostle. Again, this fits sort of the circular letter idea. Uh, If he's writing only to the Ephesians, uh, he doesn't really need to identify himself that carefully, but he very often refers to himself as an apostle. Um, Have we talked about that word apostle, a sent one? Um, but usually has the idea, one sent with authority. And Paul, of course, has that authority, although he's not stressing that right now. So Paul, writing to the saints who are at Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing noteworthy about that. It's his typical greeting. Uh, Grace peace. Uh, Peace, even if you go to Israel today among the Jews, shalom, they will say peace. Uh, And grace sounds very much like the the traditional Greek greeting, and and Paul likes to put those two together. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Notice all the the references to blessing. Um, Who has blessed us in uh, the heavenly uh, us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Notice how he blessed us. It starts with a blessing to God, a blessing of God, speaking well of God, because he has blessed us, and he's blessed us in Christ in the heavenly places. Um, that is my, my identity, who I am. Those blessings reside in the heavenlies. I can't always see them here on earth, <laughs> but they, they are rooted in who and what Jesus is. Notice he blessed us in Christ, but he, uh, he blessed us just as he chose us. Now, he, he blessed us in Christ just as he chose us in him, but he did that not when we believe. No, he chose us before the foundation of the world. It goes back where we have always been known, in fact, it's stronger than that, we have always been chosen by God. Now, think about this, because our Jewish friends refer to themselves, rightfully so, as the chosen people. God had chosen them. But we, and the we here is largely a Gentile audience, uh, um, the the church in in Ephesus was primarily, not exclusively, but primarily Gentile, um, and they can refer to themselves as the chosen people, not just going back to Abraham, but going back before the foundation of the world. He continues, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, notice, the God and Father. God, God the Father is mentioned. He's the one who has blessed us. Um, 
just as he chose us, that's, I think we're still talking about God the Father, although um, if you say, well, that's the whole Trinity, I'm not going to argue the, the point. Uh, just as he chose us in him, and so he did that, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, that is, before God. In love, he predestined, no, he not, not only chose us, but now he uses a different term. To predestine means to decide beforehand, to choose out, and to dictate what that will look like. That's, that's actually literally what the word means. Um, uh, sort of to pre, <laughs> preordain, predestine. And he predestined us to adoption as sons. Now, that's not apart from the gospel. It's through Jesus Christ. But notice it's through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. God is the subject throughout this to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And notice you mentioned Jesus Christ already twice, but then when we talk about how he, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, Jesus is the beloved. By the way, I'm not sure that we're supposed to see uh, a title for Jesus here, although beloved works nicely. But remember that in Hebrew, the word beloved, the way you say that is Dawed, or we say David. The word David means beloved. There's actually a passage over in Song of Solomon where it says, uh, I, am my, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And, and the word there is David. I am my David's and my David is mine. Um, and of course, they're, they're translating and not supposed to see the name. But there's a sense in which I say it because Jesus is the better David. He is the David. He is the beloved. Verse 7, in him, um, and we just mentioned Jesus now, so I think that's who we're talking about now. We're going to come back to the Father in a moment. But in him we have redemption through his blood. That's, that's obviously Jesus. It's, it's, in, it's his blood, his death upon the cross, his shedding of blood, his giving of his life, which shedding of the blood is the outward way to see that, that his life was taken. No, I shouldn't say his life was taken. His life was given. Um, he corrected Pilate when Pilate said, Pontius Pilate said, uh, don't you realize I've got the power over life and death? I could take your life. And Jesus said, no, no, you don't have that power. <laughs> you just think you do. It just looks like you do. But you really don't have that power. And so we have redemption through his blood. That is, we've been set free. That's the redemption part uh, through his blood. Uh, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now, notice it's uh, the forgiveness is according to the riches. Now, when something is in accord with something, that means that they are on sort of on the same level. Our forgiveness, well, you, you say, well, how, how many, many riches does God have? He's got all the riches, you know, the whole universe full. And that's how much forgiveness we have. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us. And so notice it's the riches of his grace. Now, I think we're back to talking about uh, uh, the Father here. Uh, that he lavished upon us um, in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in, in him, goes back to Jesus again, because it's in him that we have redemption. Verse 10, we continue the same sentence. By the way, notice it's a very long sentence. Uh, in fact, it's even longer. Let me just say this. It's even longer in the Greek text. Um, we put a period at the end of verse 6 in, in our English translation. There is no such period in the Greek text. Um, he, Paul begins talking about the Father and then moves to the Son. And I'm going to, spoiler alert here, he's going to uh, speak next about the Holy Spirit. Um, and he doesn't take a breath. He doesn't stop for a sentence or a period. It's one sentence from, in the Greek text from verse 3 all the way to verse 14. Uh, but we'll throw in a few, we'll allow the translators that have thrown in a few periods here. But still, they're trying to give you the sense that this is one long, continuous sentence with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ. Notice Jesus is mentioned there. Things in the heavens and things upon the earth in him. Um, is this... God or Christ, I'm going to leave it up for grabs. And him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, having been predestined according to his purpose. I think that's, uh, that's the Father. The Father purposes, the Son fulfills, and we're going to see 
uh, the Spirit reveals. And God works all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice who works all things after the counsel of his will. Um, do you see that? That he predestined according to his purpose. Now, when I say predestined, that's not just predestined according to who would be saved and who would be lost, although it includes that. But our salvation is according to his purpose, who works all things. Not just salvation. Not just things that are mentioned in the Bible. He works all things after the counsel of his will. That's, that is a God who is in control of all things. What do all things mean? I think they do mean all things, verse 12, to the end, to the result, that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, in him, you also, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, notice, um, you heard, having also believed, you were sealed in him, in who? In Christ, with, and now we change to the third person of what we call the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of promise. And so we notice throughout this section, uh, Paul hits the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. The, um, the idea of a pledge was that you would be given something as a promissory note that you were going to get the real thing. In fact, um, just the other day, I had some shoes that are uh, I really like these shoes, but they're starting to get worn out at the soles. So I took them into a shoe repair shop, and they said they would have it by Thursday. I'm recording this on a Tuesday, so a few more days. Uh, I will be going in to get them. And I have a sticker that they gave me that says I paid for them, and they are my shoes. And so when I go in to pick them up, I will bring in the sticker, and that's the pledge that the shoes will be not only ready, but there's a receipt there that says it's bought and paid for. We have something that says we have been bought and paid for. We have the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. Notice how he's called the Holy Spirit of promise. That is, there's a promise been given, and we've been given the Spirit that is a guarantee that we'll, we will receive what has been promised. Notice, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. I haven't received the inheritance yet. <laughs> it's promised to me, but I'm not finished there Yet, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, notice it's God's own possession, uh, that spirit is given, uh, to the praise of his glory. And so there's coming a day when I will come into my own. It is my possession now, but I can't see it, but one day I will. Now, we had the opening salutation in Chapter 1, verse 1, verses starting from verse 3 all the way to verse 14. We had the blessings in Christ. That's going to continue uh, to, throughout the rest of the chapter. Um, uh, both your position and your possessions in him. Uh, verses 3 through 14 are praise for what God has done, both who he is, what he, done, what he has done, what he did in eternity, what he did in sending Jesus, what he did in giving us the Holy Spirit. And God is being praised throughout. Next, we come to verse 15 to the end of the chapter, where we're going to see a prayer that we might come to fully realize those things that we've been given and those possessions that we have, but we can't see them yet. <laughs> Let's look at that. Verse 15, and I'm switching now to what I, I call a mechanical layout. Uh, I know this might look a little strange at first, but I think it actually helps you to follow the flow of thought. Uh, especially for these very long sentences. So notice how he says, For this cause I also, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which is among you, and so he's heard of the faith and the love which you show toward all the saints, and I also, having heard of those things, do not cease, notice the, the main idea is, I also do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17 making mention of you in my prayers, that, and here's what he's praying for, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and that that wisdom and revelation, notice that spirit, would bring in the knowledge of him, and having enlightened the eyes of your heart, that you may know, so what he's praying 
is that God is going to give you knowledge, that God is going to enlighten the eyes of your heart, that he's going to sort of turn on the lights. And as a result, that you will know what? That you will know, verse 18, what is the hope of his calling? And, of course, when you talk about the hope of his calling, that's the position that we have in Christ, our, uh, the identity that we have in him. Um, that, that's our wealth. Um, of course, all of this, in a sense, is our wealth. Uh, rest of verse 18, that you might know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, again, those are wealth words. Um, and it's the possession that we have. We have the inheritance of his glory in us. So, uh, again, our wealth. And then verse 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? So um, there, there is the power idea. This power is directed toward us who believe. Um, notice you, you went uh, from our wealth to our inheritance to our work. And notice that there is a movement from hope to glory to power, where he is seeking that we might enjoin this power. We continue, in the heavenly places far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. We have an inheritance that is literally out of this world. <laughs> and not only that, he put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, it doesn't look that way sometimes, but it is. He is, God's in charge of everything. Jesus has been put in charge of everything, and gave him to be head over all things, to the church. That is, Jesus uh, has been made the head of the church, which is his body. Now, when we were in Colossians, we noticed that Colossians talks about uh, the Jesus as the head of the church. It's mentioned here, but the emphasis here will be about his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all, that, that as we come to Christ, we become part of his body, and we complete that. We bring fullness to that. So we, we sum up, notice this chapter has been talking about who you are and what you have today in Christ, what he has accomplished. Next, we're going to see what you once were apart from Christ. That's how chapter two begins, but we'll look at that next time.